Hi, I'm Craig Frazier of Air Syndicate. This is K Daddy and D Bob of Cal Concepts. And we're here to introduce you to the first part of a three video series on automotive airbrushing and custom graphics. First truck we're going to be painting for you, this 1987 Mazda right in here. Hi. I'm Dion Giuliano from Cal Concepts. We're getting ready to do the 87 Mazda. Uh, we're going to be doing a six color graphic job and we're going to start with the first color. The first color will be yellow and here's K-Daddy Gan with the blue 3M quarter inch fine line tape. Okay, what we got going here is he's using the 3M quarter inch fine line plastic blue tape. What it is, it's a flexible blue tape and it, lay, it, it enables him to pull the line with continuity and with the bending pattern all at the same time. Um, we've tried other tapes. The other tapes, they don't work. This is the only product out right now that when you go to lay the tape and then when you go to mask the tape you don't have any bleeding from when you're when you're spraying the colors now we've already laid the the first color out which is yellow on the other side and we've already laid a couple guidelines and pencil you can't really see him but he's working on the first part of the arc and the reason why we're doing the yellow first is because we li he likes to start from the front of the truck and work his way back and we try to pick one of the first main yellow being one of our main colors a primary color and then we will work the other colors around with it uh, the yellow is going to overlap over all the colors in the front of the truck from the fender to the middle of the door and then it'll be pretty much by itself bottom at the bottom of the wheel He's working on getting the curve. When you when you lay the tape, it doesn't always curve right the first time. So sometimes you'll have to pull it up, lay it again. Usually you can pull it up two or three times. And if that doesn't work, then he'll pull it off and he'll lay another color. Well, he's he's got the top line laid and he's going to work on the bottom part of it. And then he'll bring it back around. He'll work the outside lines first and then and then enclose it on the inside. Um, these colors, this, the way this yellow is being laid, it's, once he gets it laid, he'll razor blade the edge of the uh, door, and then we'll go ahead and run the graphics on the inside of the door, and then we have made a fiberglass uh, door panel, and we'll run the graphics through the door jam and then onto the door panel. He's got the outside line pretty much on there, and now we're going to the inside line. I'll give you a little history of this truck as he's laying that out and you can kind of get a feel of what he's doing. He's everything most of the stuff we do with the graphics is pointy, spiky. We don't the straight line stuff, it's it's out. It's you know, it comes in, it comes out. So you, when you lay in these lines, you got to try to lay them with some with some bend. And anyhow, we'll get back to that, but a little history on this truck. This truck was featured in Truck and Magazine in October of 1993. Uh, it was sold, and basically, when it was featured, the the door handles were already shaved, the tailgate was shaved. What I mean by tailgate shaved, the tailgate is uh, welded shut on the truck with the roll pan welded underneath it, and we have uh, mounted in a license plate box in the back. Uh, the only changes that we're making from the truck from now to then is the interior will be different. We've installed fiberglass door panels, uh, fiberglass dash. We're putting a uh, 95 Toyota front bumper and front valance on it. And, and then, of course, we did the repaint. Now, before we started, the, the way the truck, the shape the truck is in now to get to this stage, uh, we stripped the truck. We stripped it with an uh, aircraft remover. 
all the way down to bare metal. Uh, we were very careful on some of the existing bodywork, so we didn't have to redo that. And uh, then we went ahead and uh, reprimed the truck. We blocked it out with 80 grit. We d we don't go ever below 80 grit because then when you get into the 36 or the 24 or the 18, you're getting too deep of scratches and they're too hard to fill and it's just too time consuming. You're better off in the long run to just try to go to 80. It's going to take a little longer, a little more work, but it's going to be better for you in the long run. He's, let me go back to where Kyle's at on the truck. Uh, he's laid the inside line and he's bringing the spike back around to the bottom. Now you have to be real careful when you're pulling the tape to keep it consistent. That's why he has just lifted up the top tape because he's happier with the bottom line so now he's got to lift the top tape back up. That's why you don't want to always press it down real, real tight so you can lift it back up. And then uh, he can match, you know, keep the distance, the width in between the two lines. Now it's a lot closer than it was. It, it wasn't as close. Now when you get into those edges right there where you just saw him pressing, into the body panels and the grooves there, you have to press that down because the blue tape's flexible. And if you, as long as you keep pressing it, you'll finally get the tape to work. Well, it'll, it'll stay into that groove. Right there where you pushed it in, right there up on the front wheel well. He'll have to check that right before we paint it. We'll have to check all the grooves before we paint it to make sure the paint doesn't, the tape isn't lifting up. Because if the tape lifts up, then you're going to get a bleed. Well, at this stage, a bleed isn't real bad because you're on your first color, but when you start getting into two, three colors and, and when the effects have been done on the graphics, such as fades or some of the airbrushing or the different techniques that Craig Fraser will be using, you know, you don't want to get into where you're going to damage any of his uh, airbrushing or the effects. So you have to check the tape always to make sure it's all the way down. Now he's going to go ahead and cut the tape loose from the uh, edge of the door and you got to always check this once or twice because a lot of times you'll go to, you know, you're, you're getting ahead of yourself, you go to open the door and you'll pull the design off and then you'll have to redo the design. And, you know, it's, it's hard once you get it down to uh, keep it down. So, you know, now he's going ahead and uh, we're working the blue tape up. Now, a lot of people, when they do door jams, they usually just go straight in off the line and just run colors straight on in. Well, you, you know, you don't want to do that. Keep the if the graphics moving up, keep the graphic moving up in the door jam. And you know, this is this is time consuming, but in the long run, when you you know, you're going to show your vehicle. I mean, these are the extra points. This is this is the advantage that the paint job is going to bring the customer when competing against somebody else who's done another paint job. And uh, when they start judging these paint jobs, I mean, the quality is so high right now with all the painters. This is the, some of the areas that they're going to look first to see where the other painter is better than the other painter. You know, I mean, when, when these guys show these trucks, they get real critical on the graphics going in the jams. And, you know, this is just, a, this is just an advantage for showing it and, you know, it makes your paint job look that much more better. All right, what we got going now is uh, we've gone ahead and cut the tape away from the door. We've opened the door up, and we're laying the graphic on the inside of the door jam, and then he's going to run it into the door panel. Now, uh, when you do these trucks and these graphic, you know, you can't just go off the top of your head. You've you got to start with a design or a rendering or something on some paper. That way you've got an idea of what you're doing, and then you can keep that going. Now, when you lay these lines, when you pull straight lines, you gotta, when he, when he runs it into the jam and it hits the door panel, you gotta press it down tight onto that edge before you pull that line because that line has to be straight. So when it goes to be pinstriped, because the pinstriper is gonna follow either the top part of the line or the bottom part of the line, that way the lines will look straight because the pinstriping, if the pinstriping isn't done right, it'll make your graphics look not right. So that's why he's pulling that taping it down at the end and then pressing it all the way through. We're moved to the back of the truck now to the tailgate. 
Now, one thing about the back of the truck, you know, I said that you need to have a uh, drawing or a rendering or some type of graphic drawn. Well, K Daddy Gan is famous for his tailgates and hoods, and those are full freestyles. He just he likes to look at the graphics as he's getting ready to lay it, but the graphic on the back has nothing to do with the side or the front. The front and the back are always different. This is a freestyle mode he's in. He's going to just lay it how he feels like laying it. It's just, a, it's just a feeling and a movement that he uses with the tape and the area that he's going to work with. Like I said, he's using the 471 quarter inch blue 3M because that's what he prefers. Uh, sometimes when he gets into these tighter, smaller areas, he'll go to the eighth inch, but right now he's sticking with the uh, quarter inch. And uh, he's going ahead and laying the outside of the line first, and then he's going to work towards the inside. Now, you, this is the part of the truck that I was talking about where the tailgate was welded up shut and the roll pan was welded with the uh, rear license plate box. And uh, we're just we're going to let him do his thing and... He's going to just move from the box and in and out, and he'll, he's going to play with this a while because this is a, he's in the freestyle mode, so we're just going to let him go with that. Okay, we've uh, laid the three-quarter inch tape on the sides around the blue like this, and now we're on the back. The reason why we're laying this three-quarter inch tape around the blue is because when you go to paper it, it makes it that much easier to, pay, to paper and you don't have to worry about um, a whole... Use, right now we're in, when you're doing these graphics, you're going to use so much tape as it is. You want This will help cut down on your cost when, the, when this tape runs you know, anywhere from 250 to 320 a roll. So he's going to go ahead and surround the color completely with three-quarter inch tape using the uh, 3M 233-3. And then what we'll do is uh, around the area where the three-quarter tape is, we'll fill it in with the uh, 3M paper. So we, like I said, this is a repetitious event we're doing here. This has already been done throughout the whole truck, and this is how we'll do every color from here on out. The only other difference is between the first color and the rest of the colors is some of the other colors are going to overlap or run underneath. So there'll be more masking because you'll be back masking some of the other colors to make it go over the top or make it come underneath. We've laid all the tape around the blue on this first color, now we're going to go ahead and start masking. We're using the yellow 3M paper 06718. It's a, a photo process paper. It's real smooth on the inside. It cuts real easy with the razor blade. What he'll do is he'll lay the paper and then he'll go ahead and cut around where the tape is so that way we can get the area all covered. Now on the first couple colors, it's not going to be real critical on our overspray since we don't have the main color on yet. But once we start getting into some of the graphics, we're going to have to, you know, do a lot of masking and, you know, cover the truck maybe with some drop cloths and get into some other areas because we can't have any overspray hitting any of the areas that we've already painted. So like I said, once again, we've got the three-quarter inch tape outlined, all the blue tape, and he's filling in the gaps that the paper won't fill in, and some of the areas he'll lay a piece of paper and then go ahead and cut it with the razor blade. And then we'll get on to the next step, which will be to spray the yellow. The paper, we'll start here in the back and then we'll continue the paper all the way around the truck. We'll, so when we spray this color, we don't just do the back and then go to the side. He'll go start on one side of the truck and go all the way around because it's going to take a couple coats. So we'll be masking the whole truck off and then we'll uh, throw a drop cloth over the top before we spray this color. Okay, now we've already we've gone our first part yellow, 
and we're getting ready to uh, put the balancing clear on the 695. This will be one to one to two. Normally, you'll get this color already mixed in the paint store. It's a base coat uh, color. You could just tell them, I want a chrome yellow or a Corvette yellow. You just, all you got to do is look through the book and give them a code. But uh, K-Daddy, he's going to mix a special mix. And since he has a PPG paint bank on hand, he can mix any color he wants at any given time. Uh, the gun he's using is the Iwata. It's a uh, LPS-2 Iwata, and it's a, uh, it's a uh, VOC gun that complies with the uh, the uh, standard of the EPA today and you know we need to use these guns and after he's done spraying this paint he'll also log this paint um, he's about ready to go here mix it so again one to one to two two on the uh, reactive reducer the DRR 1170 PPG and uh, it looks like we're ready to go he will be wearing a disposable uh, 3M mask we recommend that anytime you do any type of painting you, you especially with these types of paints today you need to wear a mask or a fresh air ventilate ventilation system but we're going to use a disposable mask on this since we're not going to be spraying too much paint at one time so it looks like we're about ready to go and here we go on the first color You need to have the area either gray or white when spraying a yellow. If you start getting into some darker colors, it's going to change the yellow. This way the color will stay consistent throughout the graphic. Now he's, he's starting in the front fender well and he's working his way back and around the door. Now he's opening the door and he'll work his way into the, the uh, graphics. Now the primer that we used was a DPW18-21 and we prefer the gray. And then when we get into some of our transparent colors, we'll go ahead and spray white before we spray the color. But here, the yellow will cover quick over gray, and uh, he, here he goes with uh, spraying the first color. Now, when you're working in the jams in that area, you have to use a little bit lower pressure to keep the overspray down. But the vehicle is all masked up, so it's not going to be a problem either way. Uh, be sure that when you're spraying these colors, you want to use the right reducer for the right temperature. Now we're looking, we're about 68 degrees, so we're using an 1170. So we got a five degree, uh, we can go five degrees warmer, five degrees colder off of that last number, the 1170. So we're looking at 70 and we're right in the ballpark. So he's going to go ahead and he's working on the second coat now. On a yellow, it's going to take about three coats and then he'll come back all the way around and then back into the door and then he'll work his way all the way around the truck. Now with this Iwata gun that he's using, he has a lot of uh, fluid control. He has two different controls to control the fluid and then he can control the amount of fluid with the air pressure. He's got his tip tuned in about three quarters of the way on the fan and uh, the fluid level is about medium. So it's a, it's a pretty easy color to spray when you're doing it this way and you can just take your time and let it go. The air is always on. And uh, just about getting covered now. You want to be sure when you're spraying it, to, you can don't just paint the area, but paint a little bit over the area so it's going up on the paper. That way, when you unmask it, the edge of the yellow is going to be consistent with the rest of the graphic. It's kind of dry. We're going to come in with an airbrush and do a type of fade in the graphic itself. The paint's been set for about half an hour or so. It's still fresh, so I don't need to sand it. I'm going to come in using my HPC uh, Iwata airbrush and spray in a red oxide fade. The red oxide also has a slight amount of gold pearl in it, so that when the light hits it, it'll give it kind of a strange streaky effect. Now, I'm not going to do just a, a, a real normal gradated fade. This is kind of like more of a, I don't know what you call it, an evil fade. I'm going to make it kind of streaky, like make it look kind of aged almost. Now, the nice thing about this red oxide is it's very transparent, so when it's cleared, you'll see a lot of the yellow through it. At the same time, the color will stand out. So, 
just by varying the amount of paint I spray on here, I'm able to create a large number of colors because of the underlying yellow base. Same time, I don't want to get real close, I don't want a real defined edge. I'm going to make the top darker than the bottom, of course, being it's going to be a fade. Maybe come in every now and then for a, a tight streak. And slowly work myself to the front. The paint I'm using here is the same two-stage base coat that Colin and Dion are shooting the graphics with, so I have no problems with compatibility. The main difference is, is I reduce this probably about twice as much as they do, to the extent of almost 200% more. The reason for this is the airbrush is much smaller than a normal gun, therefore the paint needs to be a lot thinner to shoot. The good thing about this is it makes the paint even more transparent, therefore easier to use and a lot more forgiving over base colors. The bad thing is you gotta be real careful since it's so thin, it really wants to run. So it's important to keep your movements fast and not stay in one spot too long when you're airbrushing. So I'm bringing this fade up from the bottom. Notice how I have the fade on the top and the fade on the bottom as well. I wanted to make it look kind of not so much three-dimensional, but give, give it actually a, an actual shape of depth by only having one side shaded at a time. Bringing those streaks in as well. The nice thing about the streaks is it gives it a little bit more character than just a simple fade, and it's a lot easier to do than a simple fade because you don't have to worry about it being even. The more uneven it is, the more it looks like you planned it. I do want the top to be evenly dark. Now it's hard to see with it still masked like this how it's going to look when it's done. I'm actually overshooting my lines and airbrushing on the tape itself. I do this for the reason that I don't want to end up airbrushing too far inside the graphic. I want it to be from the edge coming down. And by actually airbrushing on the tape and letting the overspray from the airbrush go into the work, gives it a more natural look. I don't want there to be any airbrush looking lines. I just want it to look like age streaks in the color. Make the tips really dark. Now, the reason I'm doing this is I have a lot of gold pearl in this paint, and if I make the tips really dark here, they're really gonna glow after it's cleared. You'll see more use of pearls later when we do the other effects. Getting that tip real dark there. And there you have it, evil streaky fade effects. We're all messed up for our second color, and there's a couple spots where the second color is going to actually overlap over our first color. So what we're going to have to do first is, is sand the edge left by the tape on our first color so you don't see it through the second color. We'll do that with a 400 grit wet and dry sandpaper. And it's, it's not important to get rid of all the edge, it's just just, so, just the edge, not really all the paint, just so you, can, so you don't feel the edge when you run your finger across it. And all this does is allows you not to see the edge when you put your next color over the top of it. It's important when doing graphics that to make your colors crisscross over the top of each other, it gives the, gives the graphics depth and it also makes the job look a lot more intricate than it actually is. You can see here where this is masked, this is where the yellow will come back over the blue. And then later on, Craig will do drop shadows, which will make the, make the work real deep looking. These are pretty much sanded smooth and we'll be ready to paint. Next color we'll be spraying is a blue. This is like a transparent blue. It's DMD 658. It's a it's a toner off our PPG rack again. Mix just a little bit of this. And this time I'll be adding a little bit of silver, DMD 650. This will give this will make the paint not so transparent and should uh, enable us to do less coats, which 
give us less, and less of an edge on our graphic, which would be better. I'm also going to add some Blue Pearl PRL 92. This will give it a real brilliant effect once it's cleared at a kind of glow. And I'll also add my mixing clear, which turns the paint into the DBU system. You mix this 50-50 to what's, what toners you have in the cup already. And then you'll add the reactive reducer 1170. Again, 50-50 to what's in the cup. That's about it. Stir it up. Always use a paint strainer because it, it uh, gets out any impurities in the paint, any dust, any dirt that might have got on the lids or anything. It just keeps it from getting on your paint. But you can see in the in the paint how brilliant it is with the silver and the pearl already. Once it's on the truck and cleared, it'll look ten times better. And I'll be using the Iwata L LPS 2 gun again, as I did on the first color. And uh, we're set. We're ready to spray. Okay, we'll spray the next color, the blue, same way we sprayed the yellow. Medium coat, get it to cover. Now we'll have to allow drying time in between each coat of probably about eh, two or three minutes. It's kind of warm here, so we're the paint will dry fairly fast. You can see where the where the yellow was, it'd take a few more coats of the blue to hide that yellow, but just keep adding blue and it, it'd eventually hide itself. This stage right here with the blue already laid on, uh, giving it some time to tack, I'm going to come in and do another airbrush effect. The effect we're going to do on the blue is actually a marble effect. Uh, I start out with this using my Iwata HPC. And I use the same type of color blue collate on here, but it has a little bit more of a purple toner in it. And what I'm doing at this point, I'm laying down a base of just darker streaks. No matter what color it is, I always like taking a similar color that I'm doing the marble on, and just come in and lay some varying streaks with a darker version of that color. I didn't, since this is fairly a dark blue, I decided to use violet to actually darken it up. Now notice I'm going in the same direction. To mimic a marble pattern, I'm going to give it a kind of a grain. I'll pick the direction and keep all the streaks in the varied same direction to give it some continuity. Notice I'm going way over the tape edges. I don't want the grain to stop right before a tape edge. Now once I've got some streaks laid on there, I'm going to come in and loading up the needle by pulling the trigger back. Notice how the paint drips out when I do that? I'm going to load up a lot of paint in this airbrush and I'm going to start flicking it onto the work. And what this does, this gives a stipple effect. Now you can do this numerous ways. You can do this by placing a business card or a paper clip or a, or a um, clothes pin in front of the airbrush and loading the paint up. This right here is kind of a nice random effect. It's real quick. If I was to do this over a large area, I probably would lower the air pressure and actually use a larger gun to create the pattern. But since it's a small confined area, I'm not wasting any time by doing it this way. And I'm going to give it a lot of these dark stipples. Now you can't see them a whole lot, but there's a lot of pearl in this paint. And once this graphic is cleared, these dots are going to come out and give it type of a grainy texture that'll make it look a little bit like a, a really uh, heavily textured marble. Okay, with all of this on here right now, the, the thing to be careful is when you come back to airbrush, be real careful about airbrushing around these uh, dots because they're so heavy, they're going to take longer to dry. Switching airbrushes, basically it's the same brush, I just have a different color in it right now. I took the original color blue again and added a little bit of different pearl and added some white. I create a little bit of a darker, a little bit of a lighter version of that blue. Now I'm going to come in, starting out with the stipple again. And this brush is actually a little bit of a finer brush, so look at, if you notice, the stipple is a little bit finer. Now it looks like there's a lot more of this white stippling going down in the dark. In actuality, it's the same amount, because it's light, you just notice it more. And again, randomly, I want different sized dots, I want it to be random, at the same time I don't want to just concentrate in one area, have it fade out. I want overall on the whole basic effect. Okay, giving this a little bit of time to dry. When we come back in next, and I look, make sure when you're doing the stipple effect, before you start airbrushing again, you blow your airbrush out because it has a tendency of loading up the tip really bad on these airbrushes. Now using the same lighter color blue, which actually looks white by comparison to the dark blue here, I'm gonna come in and give it some very fine veins. I'm actually gonna probably drag the tip of the airbrush slightly across the surface. I'm gonna start off 
of, on the tape area to make sure I don't have a real thick line going. And come in and just give these really thin, wispy veins, like you know, a type of vein that a marble would have. And I continue them on through. Now, I don't want them to stop, but what I'll do is I'll pull my airbrush further away and they'll end up actually fading out on their own. Again, sticking with the overall direction, continuing the grain effect, I'm able to give the illusion a very extremely, extremely textured Italian marble. Fogging in some areas. I'll create areas where the veins are actually meeting right here in the middle, these streaks, and there'll be a lighter, brighter area. I'm going to move over here to the tip. Notice I continue the streaks off the tape to make sure I don't have any lines stopping in the middle of the graphic itself. I might give a couple of bright areas right around where they focus in. Starting on this graphic now, off the tape, coming through. Now, if I don't follow the direction exactly, it's okay. As long as the, the general direction is observed. Now, I can overlay some of these lines, have them cross each other. The more I actually make them cross and actually divert from one another, the more interesting the actual texture is going to end up being. It won't end up looking like some kind of pattern that you just laid on here. It gives it more of a hand-painted look to it. Bring in some of those bright areas. I want to also fog in some pretty thick lines. They're not even lines, they're just fogged areas. Because of the pearl in this, that'll show up kind of as just a, a, a reflected area of the marble where the light's hitting it. A couple more dots in that area. This right here is actually a very small area of the graphic. It'll look completely different when this tape is pulled off. Important thing to do is not get carried away when you're airbrushing on these graphics. Because you have such a large area to work with, only a small area is actually being painted on. It's easy to go overkill, and then when you pull the tape off, it just looks way too busy. So I'm pretty much going to stop right about now, even though it looks like I could go a little further, just to make sure I don't overdo it. And pretty much there you have it. A uh, nice marble texture, you saw how fast that was. Uh, depending on the colors, I could build up more and more textures by using various colors and various shades, but this is real quick, and once it's clear, it gives a real nice effect. Okay, we're getting ready to spray the third color, which is purple. Um, in the gun, I have DMD 624, which is a dark violet. I also have a DMD 650, which is the silver I used in previously in the blue, just to kind of give it depth and not not take so many coats to cover. And I also put a little bit of DMD 670, which is a magenta, just to lighten up the purple. I'm going to begin to spray now. As with all the other steps, we just repeat this all the way around the truck. So I'm just working on the bed panel now. The same things apply all the way around the vehicle. At this stage, I'm coming back with the airbrush again to do another effect in the, in the graphic. The effect we're going to be doing is called a, a stencil effect using a pearl to create a ghost image. The stencil I have right here, I just cut out of a normal piece of photo paper, and it's of a skull. Um, notice the negative image of the actual design. Uh, you have to make sure all the inner pieces are connected to hold together. When you press it up against the area you wish to, to paint on, make sure it's, it's pretty, pretty tight down there. And then using the airbrush, I come in there with the paint and build a pretty heavy layer up, making sure not to overspray onto the other areas. As you see right here, an angle, the light will catch it and reflect the blue, or another angle, it just absorbs it and shows a purple. This is done by an actual uh, material called pearl. This right here is basically a combination of inorganic pigments that absorb all colors except for the one that they're supposed to reflect. This is blue pearl, therefore it reflects blue. So when the light hits it at just the right angle, you'll see a reflection blue, blue back. Now using this stencil, I'll continue to do the same image randomly throughout the design. Be very careful when you're moving the stencil around because it's real easy to hit on top of the previous paint. I don't press down very hard. I make sure it's I got a tight seal, but I don't press down on the other image because it may be wet. Uh, there's also a possibility of uh, moving around and randomly uh, 
using the stencil and that's the way you keep away from the, the areas that still may be wet but by doing that you may work yourself into a corner. You want these to look random but at the same time to be pretty much spaced out. Some of these skulls will appear halfway on the design, some will appear all the way on. Some I'll have really blasted the color into and the other ones I'll just really leave not really that dark at all. But taking the same image over and over again, the single image of the skull itself actually becomes a type of pattern, which from a distance, you can't really discern what it is, but it creates a nice effect. Okay, on this color, uh, the fourth color, it's going to be magenta. I've already sprayed a white base using the same mixing techniques as we have in the past colors. 50-50, 50% color to 50% reducer. Uh, the reason we use a white base with the magenta is because it's highly transparent. And the lighter the base, the brighter the color. And if I was to spray the color over the gray, it would look kind of muddy looking. It wouldn't look real good. And that's about it. The color I'll be spraying is uh, 673. It's a magenta toner. Uh, it's got a red pearl in it to give it a more vibrant look. And that's about it. I just go light coats and not get in a hurry. Probably take three or four coats for this color to cover all the way because of its transparency. And that'll be about it for your first coat. You'll you'll repeat that all the way around the truck and let it dry for five to ten minutes and go again until you get the color you want. In this part of the graphic we're going to start doing an airbrushed effect. It's just basically just improvisating using a bunch of wire ties taped together. You can do this with uh, really any object, just creating a unique stencils, experiment with them, see what kind of effects you get in the graphics. This gives a real nice kind of a streaky look and the paint I'm using is a combination of the uh, 673 DMD um, magenta toner as well as the deep violet with a little bit of blue pearl. Now I'm going to come in placing the stencil, since this one right here it doesn't really, it's a random stencil, it doesn't need to be placed exactly on the surface. I'm going to move it about, I'm just going to place it lightly up against where the graphic is and just fog in some of this color. Moving as I go along, giving it kind of a zebra, zebrish kind of weird effect. Now, the nice thing about this is, is that you won't notice the design as much until it's clear because so much of it is pearled. Because of the roundness of it, I can always come back and add a little bit more to where I think it needs it. Unlike the other stencil, you have to be really careful with the wetness of the paint so that it might, you know, because if the stencil gets too wet, it'll start leaking through. This one, any leaks will actually add to the effect itself. Continuing back as I go along. Just spraying the effect in. Now this will continue all the way around on all of the magenta and then as soon as I'm done with uh, using the stencil to get the effect, I'll come in with the same color that I just did the effect in, but I'll lightly fade the tips. Remember, this isn't, this doesn't show up very much with this. It basically is, is a whole lot of pearl, just a little bit of paint. So when it's cleared, you'll see a major difference. I'm going to do a slight fade on the top of the graphic itself. This fade on the top only, top side of the graphic only will give a real nice three-dimensional look to the graphic. We'll round off the top of it. Again, being careful not to overdo it. You don't want to lose the original color of the design itself. And there you have it. Another pearl effect with an airbrush.
Okay, we're going to shoot our last color, which is a silver. It's a background color for all the all of the existing colors that are on there. So what we had to do is mask off all the existing colors on the truck. Um, I'm using DMD 635 mixed with balancing clear and uh, at a 50-50 ratio with the reactive reducer. And we're ready to spray. Silver covers over the gray pretty much really fast. Usually only takes a couple coats of silver. Same with all the other colors, just put a light coat and don't get in a hurry. Get it to cover so you don't get any run. There's your first coat. Let it dry five or ten minutes and come back again, probably two or three more coats, and it'll be done. For the final graphic on this uh, job, we're going to put an effect on that uh, it's kind of looked like diamond plate using the stencil pattern, uh, much like we were doing earlier with uh, some of the effects. I'm going to be spraying the same type of Regency silver on here, but I've added a black. Um, toner into it to darken it up a little bit to create a shadow effect. Now, basically doing the stencil just like before, be careful not to get it too wet. Using my HPC Iwata, I'm going to spray the, mainly on the bottom side of these shapes. The reason I'm doing that is I want the top side to be a little bit lighter. It won't be much lighter, but just a little bit lighter. It'll give the illusion like the top being illuminated by some light, like actual diamond plate has. Okay. Now, bas basically, when doing this diamond plate, it's real convenient to have a large pattern. That way, you can, when you hold it back over, there'll be like one line that you won't use again. And you use that for your reference line. I'll line up the first row with the back of the stencil, and then go from there and start airbrushing in the next series. Now, these stencils are all done on photo paper just as the original ones were. The nice thing about photo paper by comparison to using like very thick cardboard is for one thing the paint doesn't soften it up a lot and you can fold it such as inside this body line right here to get a crisp stencil I'm going to have to lay it in there and hold it with my fingers. It was a thick cardboard I couldn't get it to fit inside of there thereby getting the stencil to go all the way inside. I'm going to come along and tie this one in right here pressing it in. If you're using a large stencil like this one, you might want to try rotating it every now and then, keeping the wet side over there, letting that dry while you're working with this side. That way you prevent a large buildup of paint which can come around the back side of the stencil and actually get on the work. Okay, I got a little bit of a double one right there. We'll hide that with a shadow actually. That's another problem. Be real careful when you're going over with your stencils not to get doubles. Got one right here has a little mark on it from the paint being wet. I'm gonna come back over. You can touch them up too with the existing uh, stencil by going back over the ones. Now, with the diamond plate pattern there, I'm gonna actually come in and put a light drop shadow. This is area right here is an actual graphic that's been taped. I come in and put a light shadow. This is a metallic. I'll come back later after the taste been removed and put in a shadow with some actual pure black, a little bit weakened for the actual shadow. But right now I just want to put that in there so that when I take all the tape off, I have a reference point where all my shadows are. 
I'm going to switch airbrushes at this time to my other HPC, which I've already had loaded up with some red oxide. Now, the nice thing about red oxide is when sprayed over silver, it gives a really good rust effect. Hence the name red oxide. Again. And just randomly, every now and then, maybe have a little streamer coming down, like the, the rust is actually seeping down over the diamond plate. Put some up in me here. I'm only going to use this right underneath the graphics, like the water's collecting behind the graphics and streaming down every now and then. Put a couple of really harsh stains coming right down there. Much like water, try and follow the, the you know, line you know, straight down like gravity would. You can always have them also streaking back. One thing, if you're going to have them streaking, either have them going back at all at an angle or all down. Otherwise, you start getting some real problems with continuity. Pretty much there's my diamond plate effect with um, the rust on it. Now, when you pull all the tape off, with the drop shadows in, this whole effect will actually sink back and from a distance will give the illusion of the whole back of the truck being diamond plate behind the graphics. Real nice effect you can get with just a simple stencil and uh, some metallic paint. Okay, we're uh, done spraying our base color and uh, now it's time to peel the tape off oh, to reveal the graphics. Um, Peeling the tape, you just want to peel it nice and slow. Watch for edges that might want to peel up. Just take your time, there's no need to get in a big hurry on any of this. You see the truck's really starting to come together now and actually look tied in and everything. After we're done getting all this off, the final steps would be to Craig would come back in and do a little more drop shadowing over some colors that cross crisscross like something here. He'd put a drop shadow here to make this look like it's floating above the above the paint there. And then it'll be pinstriped and cleared several times. And then color sanded and buffed and be ready to roll. Okay, the final step before pinstriping is to come in and touch up the airbrush drop shadows after the orange has been applied. Now, because all these were masked off, some of the drop shadows that I did on the silver earlier didn't actually come all the way through. So I'm going to bring in some of these drop shadows, use my Iwata HPC and a weakened solution of um, DMD black toner. Now the solution is weak so that the color can actually come through the black. I don't want the shadow to be completely black. Okay, what I want to do is I want to broadcast this shadow that's here right on over this yellow line. Now be real careful not to get any overspray into the purple. If I do, it's still okay because the pinstripe is going to come in and put an edge right there. So it'll clean it up and I'm going to continue this right on over. If I had like varying levels of colors, I may even you know, slant off at an angle to show varied, you know, lengths of shadows to get down to the bottom. I also want to continue this one up onto the magenta. This one stops, you can tell this was all masked off. So I'm going to start down below to make sure my black matches the shadow from before. It's real weak, as you can tell, it's very faint. And I'm going to come up all the way over onto this blue. This, this yellow, orange area is casting the shadow right there. So it's good, good to give a once over on the entire project to make sure before the pinstriping is done. It's very difficult to come in and drop shadow once the pinstriping is on there. Otherwise, you have a tendency of if it's a very light pinstripe, you may end up muting the color with the black. Okay, this one right here needs to be drop shadowed as well. So 
touch up that one. And a little bit of this one right here. Okay. That's pretty much all the touch-ups on the drop shadows on the, the back of this truck. I'll continue this step all the way around the truck on all the drop shadows until I'm finished. After giving it a good once-over, making sure there's no more touch-ups needed, it's ready to be pinstriped. I'm Ron Beam. We're going to uh, do the next step in this process and outline all the graphics on this thing. Uh, first thing to take into consideration on a multicolor job like this is color choice. You want to use contrasting bright colors to give better depth and color separation and you have to pay attention, particular attention, not to uh, use a lot of a color like say you wouldn't want to put a, put a coat like an orange around this yellow to where it's not going to show up. You have to, to try to figure out all your colors in advance, make sure you're not stepping on the colors anywhere. Um, don't really have to worry about surface preparation on, some, on a graphic job like this. It's all fresh paint. Uh, there's no wax or silicone or anything we have to remove. Just tack it off. Uh, make sure there's no tape residue and, uh, and get started. You want to <clears throat> start with the color that would be your bottom color first, which in this case is basically the orange, and work from the bottom up. You get a lot cleaner edge, a lot sharper corners that way. Uh, a lot more depth. We're going to uh, start up, we're going to use House of Color striping paint because this is going to be clear coated. Um, House of Color you can clear coat quickly without any reaction problems. We're using a House of Color light blue here to start with. Uh, with a catalyst that's compatible with the clear that's going to be put over the truck. Um, in this case, we're catalyzing the House of Color with DU5, so we won't have a reaction problem with the PPG clear. We work it into the brush using a, a single lot max striping brush. Outlining graphics like this, you don't want to use too thin of a line to where it doesn't show up. <clears throat> and you don't want to use too thick of a line to where it shows up too much. You want to just hide the paint edge and add a contrasting color. Get her mixed here just how we want. I stroke the wet brush with my bare fingers to get any particles of paint or foreign objects out of it. You want to line your hand up with the line that you're going to run and paying particular attention to look in the direction of which you're striping. As you're making your line, you want to look at the line that's coming out of the brush to make sure it's the width you want and the consistency you want but you have to look also in the direction of which you're going to make sure you're following the line. You just kind of look back and forth as you're making the line. You'll get used to it. Outlining graphics is a good way to learn how to stripe. You're usually, usually doing long lines so you can get used to starting and stopping and there's a line there to follow which also helps as you can see we're just about done you can tell what a difference the contrasting colors make uh, as far as, as depth and, and color definition. Striping is something that you don't have to do on a graphic job like this, but it makes such a difference, it's a good idea. And it's not that difficult 
with a little practice. A job like this can really teach you a lot about striping, about how to start and stop, consistent color mix, and like I was saying before, you've got your lines there to follow. It's just a matter of keeping a nice clean line going. And as soon as we're done here, we'll be ready for Craig to do some hot spots. And we're ready for clear coat. Uh, I didn't cover before on how to hold a brush. A lot of people do it uh, different ways, different styles. I use the two finger method. I run the handle of the brush along my thumb and grip it with those two fingers. Some guys use three fingers. Some guys hold the brush way up here. Just whatever's comfortable for you. I like that, that grip right there. Don't hold the brush real tight. That just puts more tension in your hand and the more tension in your hand, the harder it is to make a nice straight line. Hold the brush with a loose grip and just whatever's comfortable to you. Now with all the pinstriping done, the final effect that will be airbrushed on the truck is going to be actually touching up the drop shadows that the pinstripe went back over. As you can see right here, the pinstripe went right over that existing drop shadow I airbrushed in earlier. So using the same thin down base coat black in my HPC Iwata, I'm going to airbrush in that shadow right over the existing pinstripe. I don't want it to be too dark, I just want to fade just a little bit over that to give it the illusion that the whole graphic, including the pinstripe, is underneath that drop shadow. Get that one right there as well. And pretty much throughout the entire truck, I'll come along with the airbrush and the black and touch up all these drop shadows. There's no need for using a shield at this point since I'm not really going up against any of the colors. I'm just going right over these under, underlying ones. Right here, these stripes as well. Try not to build up your shadow too much, otherwise you may end up spending a lot more time redoing all your shadows to match the ones you made too dark. All you want to do is just tone that pinstripe down just a tad. Okay, with all the, t the pinstripes touched up and all the drop shadows fine, I'm going to switch airbrushes over to my fine brush. It's my 0.2 millimeter HPC, and I've got a thin mixture of white in here. Now what I'm going to do now is what are called hot spots. And they're just little points that will uh, attract attention to like certain tips. It's just a nice way of completing the design. Making sure the brush is shooting real clean. Uh, white's real important to thin down for the fact that if it's not, it has a tendency of spitting. And since it's an opaque, it can really show up. Now, I'm not going to do just a single dot like that. I'm going to give it a tail or a streamer and fuzz it out. The important reason to do this after the pinstripe instead of before is because with the pinstripes on either side, sometimes you'll have a little bit of an overspray from that dot. And if you stripe afterwards, you can really notice the difference, especially if the overspray from the dot extends outside the graphic. But on top of the pinstripe, it looks a little bit more natural. Put one right there. I'm going to come along to this side. It's important not just to randomly do them. Kind of think, you know, if I've got this design curving right here, well, if I'm going to put one right here, Speaking back, I'm going to probably want to have them slightly arched, maybe to mimic either this line or this line right here, since all these are kind of going in this one direction. So I'm going to offset this one just a little bit right here, pull back, offset this one, pull back. That way you have kind of an arch going right there to continue the theme. Certain areas where the graphic goes and it comes back up again, I might do what's called like a double tail. And that's just a single hot spot. And then pulling back one tail and then another tail following the other direction. So I move back along the design. I just look for certain edges that I want, you know, to be accented, like right here. And we create one just coming up right there. Create one hooking around right there. On this tip right here, one little one going down. Now, just as in not enough, you know, not, not using any, you know, hot spots makes the design look kind of dead. Using too much of it makes it look way too busy. So you got to be real careful. It's real easy to get carried away on these. Another good use for these is 
any chips, uh, little uh, nicks, chips, uh, goof ups in the paint. Sometimes you'll have bleed throughs in the tape. These hot spots are really easy to go right over and cover up these bleed throughs. And at the same time, uh, it looks like you actually meant to do it. So instead of having to come in and maybe repaint an entire metallic just because of a small chip in the corner, you can actually, like right here, we have a little bit of a bleed through. If you can see that. What it is is that there's a piece of tape on either side masking this magenta. When the orange was shot, orange went right through the, the tape underneath, made a little line. Now to get that off, if I scuffed it off, I didn't end up ruining this, this effect in here. I didn't end up scuffing away the pearl. But if I come back with a hot spot right there, tail back, you'll never know it was there in the first place. It saves a lot of time on repairs. I'm going to put one right up here. Kind of balance it out. Look at the overall design. See, you know, how many hot spots you got going in a certain area. You don't know, want too many in one area and not enough in the other. I'm going to put one right down here, too. You notice sometimes I clear the brush from my hand. Sometimes the brush will be clogged. Instead of just blasting the brush, trying to unclog it on the work where it could splatter and ruin, I want to make sure I just clear that real good there. Okay, we have something right here. Okay, we have some little marks right here. Now, these right here are kind of in odd, odd areas. You wouldn't know exactly how to fix them. Well, you can create some hot spots kind of going in a direction called tracers. Don't just do just the ones that you need to fix. Add a couple more of them. And what you end up doing is modifying the actual graphic itself to have these weird little tracers in it. Now, you don't need to mimic this throughout the entire car. Just recommend using this right on in here. So basically, what I'm going to do now is, you know, go over, look for any other nicks, any little problems with the graphics, add the hot spots. If there's some areas that, like, on one side of the truck, I want them to be the same on the other. So when they're all done, I'll go back and forth, making sure they're all balanced. Continue over the whole truck once over, just doing any, any small touch-ups, and it's done and ready to be clear-coated. We're ready to go on the last phase of this uh, 87 Mazda. What we've already done, the truck's already been masked. Um, all the pinstriping and airbrushing is done. Since it's been about 12 hours on the truck, we've gone ahead and used a red Scotch-Brite pad like this, and we've already pre uh, uh, scotch brighted down all the orange. We've taken a uh, clean rag with the DX330, and we've already done this. We've pre-cleaned the whole truck. What this does is this gives you an idea if you have any flaws or anything and you need to do some touch-ups or some more airbrushing, this will give you an idea. That's what it's going to look like when it's cleared. Okay, so we're done. we've already done those two processes throughout the truck. Now we're getting into the clear phase. What we've done is we have an electric ground here that keeps all the static off the truck and uh, we've grounded the truck down. Now, if you don't want to buy this, you can run a chain or a wire, something that grounds the truck to the ground so that after it's been cleaned, there's, there's no static and dust will fit to it. Uh, I prefer using the uh, Iwata LPH-94. It's a gravity feed. Uh, the reason why I use the Iwata gravity feed is because the clear is not forced through the gun and I'm getting more material instead of air. So actually in the long run, I, I save more money by using a gravity feed when I clear. And this is the most ex expensive part of the truck is the clear coating, especially when you're doing graphics because we're going to have to re-clear the truck one more time after this. So my gun's ready to go. I'm going to show you how to mix it here. We're using the DCD-35 and uh, what we're going to do is it'll be uh, two parts of the clear here. Okay, no, normally you'd measure this with a stick or with a cup, but I've done it for about 10 years, so I'm able to eyeball it. One part of the DT reducer, the 75, and we want to stay within 5 degrees or whatever the temperature is, either way, hot or cold, and the DU5 is the hardener, and we're going to go one part of that. Two parts clear, one part reducer, one part hardener, very easy. Okay, go ahead and stir that up. And our gun is already ready to go. Normally, we'd pull the cap off, use the strainer, pour the clear in through the strainer. The last thing I want to mention is, if you can't afford an air dryer system, since we do a lot of production work, we're able to afford an air dryer system. You can purchase these at the paint store, and this will keep the 
the condensation and the, du the uh, oils and everything that is in your airline or whatever you're using, this will save a lot of problems with the fish eyes and stuff. Okay, we're, the last uh, step we have is to tack the vehicle down. We've already pre-done this. This is just a standard tack cloth. And uh, all you need to do is just uh, don't apply it real heavy because of the sticky material on it. Just go over the whole truck lightly like I'm doing here. And just normally what I do is I just pick a panel. I'll do the tailgate. I'll do the side of the bed. I'll do the side of the cab, the side of the roof. And we'll just continue on that way. That way you don't, that way you don't forget an area. Just concentrate on a panel all the way around. Now when we're going to clear this, I'd recommend you can start on the corner of the bed and work your way around and just do the bed. Or since we have a break point with the tail lights out, we can uh, start here on the tailgate and then we'll work ourselves around to the edge of the cab. Then we can come back, jump back to this area because it's still fresh enough. And then what we'll do is clear this other side of the bed. We'll clear the bed, then the cab. We'll leave the doors open, do the roof, and then we'll close the doors. Um, uh, we'll do the outsides of the doors, then close the doors and go ahead on to the front of the truck. And then we'll wait about 15 minutes and we'll do another coat. So, need to wear a mask, a 3M mask like this, because the clear has a lot of uh, chemicals in it that is real irritating to your chest. So we're going to go ahead and do a light coat on here. Uh, with the, the reason why I use the DCD-35, it's real easy to use. You don't need to use a tack coat. You can go ahead and use uh, it's two medium wet coats, uh, six to seven inches, the front of the gun, away from the truck. And when you get into these angles, you need to tilt the gun to cover this angle here. Because if you're spraying here and spraying here, and then you need to come back up to get this angle that you missed, that's where you're going to have your problems running it. And it's real easy to run it because we have, we have edges here where the pinstriping is. So we want to keep our gun angle going in this direction. When we come into any radius, tilt the gun because we're only going to make one pass. So we're going to go ahead and get going. And we're going to start right here on this edge. We're going to work our way around. And what we'll do is we'll just continue us throughout the truck. Air pressure, oh, about 25, 30 pounds. Usually I start at the bottom. So I'll start at the bottom right here. I'm going to go ahead and hit this tailgate license plate area first. And we'll just start at the bottom. Tilting our clear gun right here in this radius. And just keeping it going. Six, seven inches. Just keep the gun going fluid, letting off the trigger when you come to the end of the area, releasing the trigger. That way we don't overlap our material too much. There we go. Just going to stay with that to the edge. And it's punching out very nicely. Now the first coat is not going to cover it completely. The second coat will really, you'll get that mirror gloss image. So don't worry about making it shine too much on the first coat. The second coat is the more important coat. 